first, let me say thank you to our sponsor, b and Photo, who supplied both of these lenses for this review. We wouldn't be watching it without their support. Thanks again, b and All right, beautiful weather here in Maui. My dad lives about 10 minutes away. We're gonna drive down there and see what he's up to. He's a Vietnam vet. He's a very cool guy. He's very funny. He's funnier and looser than I am. I'm, I tend to be a little bit tighter and strict. We would have military inspections as a kid growing up. I mean, talking six, seven years old, he would come around on Sundays with his little uh, clipboard and we would get merits and demerits. He would judge us, I mean, everything like our beds, how clean and or, I mean, it was, it was like the real deal. If we screwed up, we would have to do push-ups in the sand, in the dirt, depending on where we were. And it was just crazy. But it, looking back, it, I mean, it was a pretty fun childhood because it, it taught me discipline, taught me that if you want to get something, you got to earn it. You know, it's not going to be given to you. My dad is a Fuji shooter. He has been for, since the X-T2 came out. And we both love Fujis. I have one, he has one. So when I do these tests, the exposure values have to be about the same, depending on the test. And I don't like switching lenses onto the same camera body. I would rather just shoot on the same camera body, which would be an X-T3, which many of you, my students have. And I thought it would just be a lot easier to borrow his camera for a day or two, go out and do my tests. I'd be able to get through them faster. Something that has me a little bit worried about the eight to 16 is 20 lens elements into 13 groups. What that means is there's 20 different lenses assembled together in this unit that is the eight to 16. So there's a lot of engineering that went into this. The first thing that worries me is sharpness because when you get lots of lens elements, you tend to lose sharpness. So that's something we're going to be looking for. Comparatively, the 10 to 24 F4, that's 14 elements into 10 groups. Still, that's a lot. And so we're gonna be looking in the corners. That's where the MTF charts kind of suggest that the weaknesses are. Looking at the center of the lenses, it looks like, holy cow. On the 8 to 16, it looks like a perfect zoom. I have a hard time with that because no zoom is going to be that sharp. In, in my experience that I have seen, even at 10 millimeters, I think the other one was 45 millimeter line pairs, it just looks too good. So some of those are theoretical models, computer models, they're not actually real test scores. And another thing that I have to mention is that lens sharpness videos on YouTube are very tough to do because there's so many variables that go into sharpness. But most importantly, lenses are made of an imperfect material, which is glass, right? So you get different sharpnesses in different copies. Even from copy to copy, you might have one that's a little bit sharper here, a little bit sharper there, but you can test a bunch of them and, and come to these averages, which is great, but I can only tell you about the lens that I have in my possession. It was brand new, and, and so both of them are brand new, and I'm looking forward to that. So let's talk about some of the other specs in terms of the lenses themselves. The 8 to 16 2.8, it's over 800 grams. The 10 to 14 F4 is 410 gram lens. So we're talking about half the weight. And the 8 to 16 is very front heavy. So when you're trying to carry it around that 8 to 16, it really does feel like it's falling forward. I don't get that with the 10 to 24 F4. That's something else to take into consideration is, is the weight and the balance. The 10 to 24 F4 feels like the kit lens, to be honest with you. The build construction, it when you pick it up and you look at it at certain angles, it almost you almost think you got that kit lens. The 8 to 16, it has a plastic leaf pedal that I am not a huge fan of. It's the only really kind of cheapy part of it. Weather sealing all over the 8 to 16. It's a red tag Fuji XF Pro lens. So those red labels are pretty important. And it also rounds out the holy trinity, so to speak, between the wide angle, the normal, and the zoom for those three lenses. If you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna get three lenses that would cover everything, that would really cover a lot of ground. You probably still want a 100 to 400. All right, at my dad's place. I wanna show you guys this truck. He has a Hummer. How you doing? How you doing, son? Pretty good. What's up? I was wondering if I could borrow your uh, Fuji X-T3. For how long? <laughs> Dad, how old were you in this picture? Which picture? The, your flight school picture. Uh, let's see. I would have been 19, I think. Wow. This is, I, Dad, I don't think I've seen this picture. 
Well, anyhow, you did such a nice job on this one. I was wondering if you could sure bring it back to life. Can I see this one? Sure. So I photoshopped this picture for my dad a couple years ago, right? Oh, at least. How are you, how are you liking your uh, Fuji X-T3? I love it. I just love it. So I love got... the menu system. I love it all. And that stuff reminds me, I have a present for you. Oh, really? Yeah. Hang on. Merry Christmas. This is the my SLR that I really? carried in Vietnam. Wow. You know, I think I remember playing with this as a kid. I want you to look at how similar this camera from 1970 looks compared to <laughs> my brand new <laughs> my brand new Fuji. How about that? So you just rotate that back and forth yep. to change the shutter speed. Yep. It's just it's so much like um, I don't know if my hand's in your way. There you go. You can see it. So you have a shutter speed from one to, it looks like 1,000. Oh, and there's a bulb mode too. Look at this right yep. here. V. Yep. And so to change the ISO, you would lift and, and rotate. rotate. Interesting. Look at that. Yep. And the <laughs> aperture controls are, of course, on the lens. It's a right. 55. So it's a 55 1.8. Mechanical timer. Yep. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So no batteries at all. All mechanical. Yeah. Man, it's kind of hard. How old do you think this camera is? Almost 50 years old. <laughs> 49 years old. A 50-year-old camera. Looks like it's in great shape, Dad. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. I know you are the one person that will really <laughs> appreciate it. Look at the similarities between the, the brand new Fuji X-T3 in terms of the look and the retro style feel in a 50-year-old camera. It looks like it still works if we, if we were to put film in there. This, oh, yeah. I have no doubt. Wow. I don't know if I told you this, but I got those um, those new wide-angle lenses from B&H. So we got the 8-16 to 2.8 and the 10-24 to 24 f4. The 8-16 to is a big lens, and it's it's huge. Let me do some tests. I'll bring your camera back probably tomorrow. Okay. And I'll, I'll just get through the test. I just don't want to change the lenses between every shot. Right. Does that make sense? Makes, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Cool. Once I had two Fuji X-T3s, I was able to take both lenses through their paces pretty quickly. For sharpness, I normally like to shoot this brick wall outside of my house and compare side by side. Wide open on the widest focal length, it appears to me that the 10-24 f4 has a very slight advantage in terms of sharpness in the extreme corners. So the 8 to 16 2.8 is going to give you more coverage, but when we're looking at the actual sharpness in those corners, the 10 to 24 f4, it appears to me just to have a very teeny bit of advantage there. Same at the telephoto end, 2.8 and f4 respectively, the 10 to 24 looks a little bit sharper. Now this could be because I'm shooting at 2.8 and I'm very close. We could be dealing with focal plane curvature. A spherical lenses are supposed to correct this and 2.8 shallow depth of field. So I'm guessing this is what's happening. And it's not unreasonable when we compare it with the MTF charts. At 10 millimeters, 5.6 for both lenses, they become more comparable and you really have to start pixel peeping to see any differences. All that said, the brick wall test may not be great for these lenses. So let's take a look at some landscape shots. At their widest focal lengths and widest apertures, the 8 to 16 has a clear advantage in the peripheral center. It's very easy to see in this wood grain texture on the boardwalk, clearly sharper in the 8 to 16. When we stop down to F8 is where we see the real sharpness of advantages of the 8 to 16 come through. Again, it's in the mid peripheral center over the 10 to 24 F4. Looking in the extreme corners again, I'm not super impressed for this type of landscape shot. I'm focusing one third into the frame. So the thoughts that I'm having on the 8 to 16 2.8 is much of this is going to depend on your depth of field and where you are focusing. For example, I think astrophotographers, because they're focusing obviously so far away, they're not going to have a problem with it. If you're shooting very, very close subjects at 2.8, your sharpness is going to be limited, obviously, to where your depth of field is. As you stop down the 8 to 16 2.8, we see the real advantages of sharpness start to come through. And again, it's in this mid-peripheral area. 
Both lenses have distortion in vignetting at their widest focal lengths, but the camera does a good job of correcting this in processing for JPEGs. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Both lenses are very good with chromatic aberration. It's minimal at the wider apertures and focal lengths. Sun flare is there, but again, it's minimal on both lenses. Nine versus seven aperture blades means more solar spikes for the eight to 16, but you wouldn't know this unless you were looking for it. When I shoot interiors, such as this CrossFit box, this is where we start to see the real advantage for the eight to 16. It's definitely wider. And another important note is this is reticulinear, which means there is minimal up and down distortion in the extreme corners. It reminds me of Canon's 14 millimeter 2.8 reticulinear prime, which is just outstanding, but we're getting even wider. And that is the reason why you might be interested in this lens. It's about as wide as you can get. So I'm starting to see something weird. If I dial in all the same settings with the, with the exception of the aperture. So if I'm shooting 2.8 on the eight to 16 and F4 on the 10 to 24, and I compensate with one stop of shutter speed, I'm seeing some weird things. The F4 looks a lot brighter. This brings in the discussion of F-stops versus T-stops. An F-stop is simply a ratio. It is the focal length in millimeters divided by the millimeters of the diameter of the opening. So if it was a 100 millimeter focal length divided by a 50 millimeter opening, that would be an F2 lens, for example. The problem with F-stops is it doesn't tell us how much light is actually making it through the lens and hitting the sensor. On the eight to 16, we have 20 lens elements. That's a lot of times that light has to go from air to glass and from air to glass and from air to glass. And what happens during those transitions is we actually lose light. So the amount of light that actually comes through the lens is referred to as a T-stop. And a T-stop calculates for how much light friction, so to speak, is caused by the lens. So this is what I'm saying. Photographic lenses are typically rated in f-stops. Cinematic lenses are typically rated in t-stops because cinematographers need to account for the differences in light when they're switching out lenses. It's very important to maintain the exposure brightness. And the truth of the matter is photographic lenses, typically we don't get any information on t-stops, but right now shooting side by side with the same cameras, it almost looks like the f4 lens is a little bit brighter when I am compensating for shutter speeds. Okay, so if I'm using twice as fast shutter speed, the F4 looks a little bit brighter. When I shoot at the same exact exposure settings, the eight to 16 looks about a third stop brighter instead of a full stop. This brings in some very important questions. Is there the possibility that there's a slight ISO shift to compensate for this? One third stop, it's not enough. It doesn't justify a $2,000 price. So the reason I want to show you this test is it's very easy to reproduce if you have access to both lenses. On the far left, we have the 10 to 24 f4. This is the raw file. Just below, we have the 8 to 16 2.8, also the raw file. And if you look below the histogram, we have the EXIF data. Both images were set to f4, 1 25th of a second. This was on a tripod, ISO 400. I'm taking a picture of this gray card on a white backdrop. On the 10 to 24, I'm off by a 10th of a millimeter. I was trying to get it in at 16. But at 16 millimeters, what we see is that when we go back and forth between these two images and we're taking a look at the histogram, the big peak on the, on the right is the white backdrop. The middle peak is the lighter gray card. And then we get the black and the darker gray card over there on the far end. See how it's kind of spread out? But when I'm jumping back and forth, we can see a clear shift in favor of the 10 to 24. So what I'm suggesting is that the 10 to 24 F4 is brighter than the 8 to 16 2.8 at 16 millimeters. So that's pretty conclusive. It's a very easy test to, to reproduce. If you don't believe me, take a look at it. Let's take a look at a little bit more evidence. So I wanted to show you guys the images that I took using a 3D printed adapter with both lenses. I know this is kind of a weird test, but I wanted to get the lenses away from the camera bodies at equal distances. So this is the same camera, same adapter, the different lenses taking a picture of an 18% gray card on an iPhone. And the thing that I want you to notice here is the vignetting footprint of both lenses. We didn't see this 
you know, in the other tests that we were doing, this strong vignetting in the corners, this is the 8 to 16 at 16 millimeters. And here's the 10 to 24 at 16 millimeters. And it's very easy to see that the 10 to 24 is brighter in the center at 16 millimeters. But there's a very important caveat to this. Remember, this is when the lenses are wide open. So this is not a perfect test. It's a, kind of a, an interesting test that I'm trying to develop, but it is clear to me that the lenses are getting at least some kind of help, even in the raw files, as soon as they are connected to the camera. So just keep that in mind. And if we take a look at the 10 millimeter, eight to 16, 10 millimeter, in the 10 to 24, 10 millimeter, the centers, of both of those become more equal. And those were also confirmed in the histogram tests. This allows us to visualize the footprint without getting the cleanup from the camera bodies. In all honesty, this test doesn't make any sense to me because it should be a 2.8 with at least a half stop advantage. And we're not even seeing that. It could be because of the pattern that it is, that is different between the two. It's also possible that the test is not as perfect as I want it to be. That's just some additional information you're not going to get anywhere else. I wanted you guys to know if you're going to invest $1,000 or $2,000 into these lenses. And this is one of the reasons I feel that extra $1,000, it just doesn't seem like you're getting as much as you think you are. There were a lot of tests that I did with both lenses, but now that I've thought about this and digested it, there's something really important I need to tell you about the 8-16 to 2.8. I was also suspicious about how much help the camera was giving the lenses. This is normal for wide angle lenses. Cameras typically have firmware from their manufacturers to correct lens distortion, vignetting, chromatic aberration on the same manufacturer lenses. So if you got Fuji on Fuji bodies, Canon on Canon bodies, Nikon on Nikon bodies, wide angle lenses are often cleaned up, especially in JPEGs. It's not supposed to happen in the raw files but I would be very curious to ask Fuji engineers if there's extra help going on in there. I think both lenses are definitely getting some help from the cameras, but the reason why I go through all this trouble to, to find out about exposure values is the lens is marketed as an 8 to 16 2.8. In my opinion, it's probably closer to a T3.5 or higher. That makes the assumption the F4. The 24 F4 is perfect and I don't think it is. And so just keep that in mind is that, you know, I think T-stop should be listed with every photographic lens. We should know how much light is actually coming through the lens. Talk about a camera conspiracy, T-stops versus F-stops. And, and so that's the advice that I'm giving to my students who have taken the X-T2 or the X-T3 crash courses. Start off with a 10 to 24 F4. I think it's a better value. It's still a great lens. It's smaller, it's lighter, it has optical image stabilization. It uses stepper, stepper motors instead of linear motors, but I think that 10 to 24 is a really good place to start. There are some things I loved about the 8 to 16. Don't get me wrong. I loved its performance in the corners. It does distort a little bit on the horizontal plane. You can see this when you take a picture of a person on the very far edge at eight millimeters. It's not as much there at 16. Uh, very impressive for a wide angle lens. It's the equivalent of 12 millimeters. Very, very impressive. The motors for tracking on a gimbal at high frame rate were outstanding. It was very good. It's weather sealed, it's construction, it's a bigger lens. I would recommend the lens to the professional wedding photographer who's trying to get a really nice establishing shot for, let's say, an album. The astrophotographer who wants the best that they can get in a wide angle zoom definitely makes sense. Interior photography for architecture definitely makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And then the landscape photographer who is printing up large prints, it also makes a lot of sense. Outside of those four types of shooting, I think the 10 to 24 is a better value. And something that I recommend to all my friends is if you're interested in these lenses or other gear, buy them from B&H, try it out for a month. And if you don't like it, return it. And that's why I love to purchase nearly all my gear from B&H Photo. Thank you to them for sponsoring this lens test. Thank you to my dad for letting me borrow the X-T3. If you are a Fuji X-T2 or an X-T3 user and you're struggling to learn your camera, check out my crash courses on both of them. I'd love to hear your comments in the description. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time.